recording. So good evening everybody and welcome to our lovely people webinar. It's really great to see so many of you here tonight and I have got my lovely guest tonight is Anne Ross. So Anne Ross and I have kind of known of each other for quite some time but we only met very actually face to face met very very recently didn't we? <laughs> we did and it was lovely to be with you in person. Mm. It's so good to uh, um, have a physicality to connect with, really. Yeah, and this is it. Mm, I'd heard lots about you and kind of knew of you and seen you sort of around, but then it was really good when we actually met in person. It was really nice, like you say, to put um, a face to the name properly. Absolutely. Mm. So... What I really love my guests to do, if you don't mind, is to tell me a little bit about you and a little bit about your principal's journey, if that makes sense. And we'll start from there and just kind of see what evolves. See. Mm. Well, Debbie, first of all, thank you so much um, for inviting me. I feel really honoured to be part of your lovely people. Ooh. <laughs> Well, you are a lovely person. <laughs> it, it doesn't always feel like it, but thank you. <laughs> so uh, about my principal's journey. Um, I was traveling all over the world, teaching, working very hard in a previous life. When, I'm, when I talk about working very hard, I was working between 60 and 70 hours a week and thought that that was really normal. I was majoring in working with people who were very traumatized um, mm -hmm. because I've always been a person that loved the deeper work. Um, I did try the coaching and um, the kind of the surface work, the goal setting, but I've always, my heart and soul have always been drawn to the deepest depths that we can go to and therefore the highest heights that we can go to and somewhere in the middle of that as well. So I was working extremely hard and wore the hat accidentally of something of an expert in trauma work and uh, loved the work, absolutely was inspired by it every day, inspired by the little miracles in front of me every day, inspired by pers people's personal transformations and then transformations within groups and then being able to share this understanding, this knowledge that I had. And in those days, I believed that, I, I mean, I didn't realize that I was burned out. I just felt exhausted a lot of the time and I felt as if I were, had nothing more to give. And I'd always been a very loving, kind of non-judgmental, very giving person. And I was getting to the stage where I just felt like a, a wet, wrung out dish towel. Just um, finding it difficult, actually, to get in the car and go to do what I was supposed to be doing. But of course, when I got there, again, I'd be totally inspired by what was happening, totally inspired by the transformations. Um, and I thought I was taking care of myself because, as you know, when we're working with others, the biggest thing is the helper, has, it's the health of the helper. Mm. So I was very aware of all that. So I was having quiet space. I was putting time out in my diary. I was having massages. I was having a lot of supervision. So it seemed to me that I was doing everything right. I was doing everything that I thought that I needed to do in order to continue doing what I loved. But the upshot of it was, I just got to the stage where I knew that I couldn't give anymore. Now, even though I had the understanding as an energy worker that energy passes through us and that that energy is limited it was an intellectual understanding, I think. And I didn't really experience it with my heart and soul. Even though I had done healing courses and um, worked with energy for a very, very long time, still I didn't see the truth within me 
which was right there on my <laughs> face that um, I wasn't feeling well at all. So I wouldn't say that I was depressed um, because I was seeing everything that I was experiencing as a belief. And in my world at that time, a belief was easily dealt with. You could simply tap it away. So on a daily basis, you know, I would be tapping away um, how I felt because, of course, in those days, we didn't experience negative feelings at all because that could lead to a whole lot of other stuff which wasn't recommended. So f I finally decided that I had to stop. And so I began to do less and less training, began to do less and less client work. But then I got really interested in my own healing. And everything that I'd ever learned wasn't working for me. So, you know, I would work with colleagues of mine who were the best um, th that they were. I would work with people all over the world that I'd come across in terms of um, energy psychology, in terms of energy healing. And whatever they did um, was beautiful and resonated with me, but it wouldn't last very long. And then I had come across Michael Neal's book, um, the very first book that he wrote. And I know I had been, because I was a coach, I'd been getting his newsletters for years and years and years. And I'd noticed that the tone of his newsletters was changing mm. because, you know, as an energy worker, we learn to read people's energies. We learn to read the energy behind language. And I was experiencing something much more soft, something much more beautiful. And then I came across uh, Dick and Bettinger, who I booked some sessions with and told him, you know, my story of burnout, <laughs> which <laughs> he was very gracious about, I must say. And after about the fourth session with him, even though I didn't understand a thing, <laughs> I began to feel better. But the healing was coming from the transmission of the energy. So in a strange kind of way, I was a person that experienced the power behind thought, the power behind or before all concepts, beliefs and ideas. So I've been very grateful and very blessed to have experienced the healing embedded in that without ever needing to understand it. So by about the fourth or fifth session, I was beginning to have the thought, hmm, I wonder if I could share this because my transformation um, had been extremely insightful. And one of my most powerful insights was never ever to work with people in the past. Mm. Never ever. And you see in my trauma work, what I would be doing in a very safe way, as safe as I could manage it, would be to take people back to their past, to the moment of trauma. Indeed, to the moment before trauma, because that's when the shock set in into our body's energy system. So you could say that for 16, 17 years, I was living not only in my own past and trying to heal my past from the past, but living in everybody else's past and teaching them how to heal at a consciousness level that the problem had originally been created. So um, I would engage people in the sound, the sight. So in trauma work, if there was the smell of blood, it was the screams, it might be a light of an oncoming car, um, it might be the smell of um, medication or hospital, and that all contributed to trauma. So you can understand why I felt burned out. Mm. <laughs> so after about the sixth or seventh session, I began to have these little thoughts. Hmm, I wonder if I could share this. And by the seventh or eighth session, I was feeling so well that I decided that I would continue my sessions with Dickon 
And then I would go back to what I was doing, energy psychology, and continue to train that. And when I was in the middle of training um, an energy psychology level three, I started talking about the principles. And I just knew in that moment that I couldn't live a lie anymore. I just couldn't teach what I didn't believe in. And so I walked away from the training, but I still had to clients and students all over the world. And I had to make sure that they had received their practitioner status, that I, I coached them through that. I made sure that their case histories were up to date. That was more difficult than the burnout mm. because I was still engaging in what appeared to me to be an untruth because I was beginning to understand that the way that I'd been working with people innocently, of course, that was the way that I was taught and many of us were taught. But I could see clearly that that wasn't true anymore and I just couldn't do it. So it was then that I walked away from a very successful practice a very lucrative practice, mm. one that took me all over the world, um, doing retreats in beautiful places like monasteries in the mountains of Idaho, like a five-star River Nile cruise, like pla beautiful places in Africa, like a beautiful island in Greece. So retreats have always been part of my deal. I've loved taking people on holiday, basically. <laughs> it was such a joy for me. And then doing the personal development work. So I worked, walked away from energy psychology and then began my training um, with one thought because innate well-being hadn't started then. Um, and Dickon mentioned Rudy and Jenny to me. So I started my training with them. Um, continued my training with them and out of that was born the invitation to me to mentor their students and then do their webinars and then train side by side with them and so um, for the last three four years um, I've been training alongside a Rudy and in the meantime, because I was, I didn't want to keep traveling up to Colchester and London mm -hmm. to get um, trainings with first generation teachers who I admired and respected enormously, um, I started inviting them to Tavern. <laughs> Good and, and it was it wasn't because I had a vision, oh my God, you know, an insight, oh, I'll do this. No, I was simply, it was purely selfish. <laughs> and I simply didn't want to do the traveling anymore. So I just reached out and then um, Dickon came in 2014 and then Elsie came uh, and then I had Keith Blevins and Valda Monroe. And then for the last three years, Rudy uh, Kennard has been coming back, backwards and forwards to Devon <laughs> and uh, we're getting ready to do a three-day retreat with him or three-day training with him in Exeter at the end of July. And in the meantime, I've created my own beautiful little intimate training and mentoring groups alongside of everything else that I've been doing and developed a meetup in Exeter over the last four years. Um, which has been an absolute joy. And I've just recently handed that over to people that I've been working with and training with that have experienced my small group mentoring as well. So that's something I've been able to bow out of and really focus on the small group training and mentoring that I love to do because people get that personal attention. Um, we have sessions in between. Uh, and then we meet once a month in a webinar. So I teach them um, how to run their own webinars, how to be with a client, what the practice kind of looks like, because that's what I've been doing for the last 
18, 19 years, and it kind of comes naturally. And once we begin to learn the principles, as you know, we don't have to be taught um, to, to, to listen. Because as we get more quiet-minded, everybody around us naturally begins to get quiet-minded. And the questions become less and less. And the experience um, becomes less and less important. And we live more moment to moment, understanding and knowing that we are the very creator, moment to moment, of our divine experience. And that each human being is God expressing itself as the individual. So we don't really have to learn that stuff. It comes naturally as we understand how the mind works and how this divine logic within all of us flows and never gets stuck. And so is that, is that enough for you? That yeah. is lovely. That was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I wonder, I know um, there's a couple of people on here that I know that are very, very new to this understanding. So I wonder if you would mind maybe sharing just a little bit about, um, because I know it is quite difficult to kind of put it into words. And sometimes people say, it feels as if you're not telling me what it actually is. So <laughs> to the best of your ability, Ability, could you give us just a little overview of kind of what you see this understanding is just a little bit of a taster of maybe you know some if someone new came to you what you might say the principles are or how you might share this with someone quite new mm. so that's a great question because because I'm so um, because I'm so embedded in the divine logic Sometimes I don't call it the three principles at mm. all, but for the benefit of those here this evening, I really make it simple, and I hope that that's helpful for those people. If it isn't, I'm really happy to develop it further from the questions that might arise out of what I'm saying. Thank you. So I see mind as the intelligence behind all things. And because I like to keep it simple, it's also what makes the daisies grow, full stop. And that's all that I know about that. And the power of thought is a creative principle. And when we talk about principle, we mean that as a fundamental building block behind all of life, even to the tiniest blade of grass. So the power of thought is the gift that I have to bring alive whatever I think, which again brings me to the principle. And when something's a principle, you can't break it down. And if you try to split it, it isn't a principle anymore. So the principle of thought is my gift to bring alive my experience. Now, the beauty of that is I can never bring alive anybody else's experience <laughs> it's only ever mine belongs to me and i can claim it now knowing that i can claim my power back from wherever i've been giving it away in my life and i might have been giving it away to donald trump the weather the politics the dog uh the slippery ice um and anything else that you care to imagine. So the principle of thought is the one that we talk about the most because the other two, the principle of consciousness, again, it cannot be split into levels of consciousness. So, you know, one moment I'm in a high level of consciousness or low level of consciousness because that gives rise to comparison, which causes confusion. Because then I'm comparing myself, oh, I must be in a really low level of consciousness here. And somebody else is in a higher level of consciousness than me. So that in my mind, talking about levels of consciousness actually 
separates us and splits us. So having talked about the three principles, what we know about that is you can never separate them. They act as one. They, if you can see what I'm doing, they act as a trinity always. You can ha never have one principle that works on its own or even two principles that work on its own. And throughout all religious and spiritual traditions, you're going to find a trinity. So the principles of mind, consciousness and thought can never be split because if we split them, it causes again confusion. It causes misunderstandings, innocent. And it causes a lot of um, unnecessary thinking on our mind. And what I absolutely know about the principles as a paradigm is that it takes stuff off our mind. So whenever I've got a lot on my mind, I know that I'm in an innocent misunderstanding about how my mind works. So again, the principles can't be split. There's only one thing going on. And the spiritual and the physical can never be split because it's all happening now, in this moment, and now, and now, and now. Nothing else exists. So it's easy to see why I got burned out <laughs> when I was exploring the path. And when I was helping people with their goals, projecting into the future. Now, it worked. It was great. And there was something missing. And that missing link was seeing thought in the moment. That totally transformed my life. Totally, in a flash, in a moment. And I've never been the same since. And each insight that we have, because this is an understanding, not of learning, not an intellectual understanding, though it doesn't matter if we're coming at it in an intellectual way, because that's okay. And to make it wrong um, just sets up a whole lot of more thinking, <laughs> which is unnecessary. So if somebody's coming from the intellect, that's no big deal. That's okay. Because sooner or later, we all have an insight. Because we've been having them since we were very young. Anyway, it's just that they were having them so fast. We didn't realize that we were having them. But as we begin to see more clearly how it works, the insights come faster and faster and faster. Because we see life much more as living in the moment. And just like I said at the beginning, it's living in the moment of creation. Because that's all that exists anyway. And how beautiful and how powerful to know that I'm safe. There's nothing for me to get concerned about. There's nothing for me to get worried or anxious about. And if I do, I know that I'm projecting into the future. Because that's what anxiety and worry are. Mm -hmm. I've lost the moment. That's all it is. And then if I see that as an innocent misunderstanding, again, not that it's wrong, because there's no wrong and right in the principles. There's simply innocent misunderstanding. Psychological innocence is the most loving, the most compassionate, the most powerful thing we can ever see. Because it's nobody's fault. I love that. I love that in the understanding. So is that helpful or are there any questions? Can I quantify or qualify something? I found that absolutely beautiful. I thought that was really lovely. Thank you. So does anybody, would anyone like to ask a question you can either unmute yourself i think you can put your hand up you can unmute yourself i can unmute you if you make it known that you want to ask a question 
Has anyone got a question at all for the lovely Anne? See, so yeah, what often happens on these webinars is people listen to my guests and we've just got the lovely, and everybody just gets peaceful and quiet. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. sort of starts having that nice, happy, sleepy look on their face. <laughs> yeah. It's such a blessing, isn't it? It's such mm. a privilege. Yes, yes. Yeah. Very much so. It's really lovely to kind of see people get into that space of just feeling that, I don't know. And so for me, when I first came across this and used to listen to people, I would go into that really, really lovely place and listen. And then I would go home and think, why didn't I ask this? And why didn't I ask yeah. that? Because my yeah. mind would just clear as I was pointed to the truth. My mind would just begin to clear and everything would just look so simple and easy. And then yeah. I guess my thinking would kick back in as I was on my way home and start <laughs> questioning. <laughs> I can remember leaving some of my training actually in tears, floods of tears. And go, oh, that was so beautiful. Oh, that was so beautiful. And when I was asked what it was all about, oh, I don't know, but it was so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. It, it does take a little time, doesn't it, to really find our own voice, find yeah. a way that works for us to share, because we're all individuals. We're all mm. here something different though every single one of us is going to resonate deeply with truth because we know what that feels like and we know what that sounds like and then in a strange and beautiful kind of way truth begins to lead us by the nose <laughs> and that's all we need to know Mm. I found a beautiful little quote if we're waiting for questions nobody has questions has anyone got a question you can put your hand up if you want to or you can unmute yourself if you want to no it seems you've made it really clear what the principles are everybody knows everything they need to know well we know that anyway don't we <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> so um, um, in the principles there's a paradigm we talk about the power of thought all the time. And when we're talking about the power of thought, we also mean the power of mind and the power of consciousness. Because like I said earlier, we can't separate them out because that just confuses the issue and gives rise to a lot of questions, which again can cause confusion. So it's important to know that there's one thing happening and that's the spiritual and the physical are happening moment to moment but the power of thought is what interests us most so i found this quote from sydney banks where he says that thought is the power notice he's not talking about personal thinking or little thinking or big mind or little mind he says thought is the power that allows us to see the illusory separation between form and formless. So there is an inseparability between form and formless because the unification is already within. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. So there's nowhere else to look now. There's nothing else to do but just to experience the resonance of truth of that. Because it answers all of our questions. This idea that in some strange way, we're separate from whatever you want to call it, you know, the implicate order, um, ki prana, it doesn't matter what we call it. That's for the individual to decide. But that this power of thought gives us the creativity to see, oh my God, there's no separation here. Mm. Now that brings us closer together, hearts, minds, and souls. 
this connection without needing to do connection. There's understanding without needing to do understanding. There's love and compassion in abundance because there's no need to do it or think, you know, I need to send somebody love. No, I don't. All that's required is experiencing the love already within. And Sydney Banks said, look within. Look within. And he didn't mean look within your brain or look within your body, you know, or look within your thinking system. He's inviting us to look within our own psyches. And each one of us has the joy of already being able to do that. So that's not a how to. We all just automatically begin to do that as we gently begin to be introspective in a responsible way with our own thinking, because that's where our experience of life is coming from. And the joy of that is when I know that it's not coming from anybody or anything else on this planet, that nobody can actually make me feel something I don't want to feel. Then I see the power of thought in action and I see the inseparability between form and formless. And in a strange kind of way, that's helped me to feel really, really safe in the world. I never realized that when I was out in the world working very hard and being quite rah rah, you know, you can do it being very self determined. I'm in charge of my life, therefore I'm taking responsibility and, you know, I can get to earn this much money if I want to. All I've got to do is reduce or eliminate my limiting beliefs. To a state of being where I know I'm not in control anymore. And guess what? Why would I want to be in control when there's a divine innate logical intelligence behind all of life that has been running the show without me being aware of it anyway. Mm. It's like, wow. It's, it's actually been quite um, beautifully shocking to me in a way to know that I wasn't in control. I thought I was, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> that was that a bit was of a, oh. the illusion. Yeah. <laughs> That was part of the illusion. But in a strange kind of way, if somebody had said that to me 10 years ago, that would have made me feel quite unsafe. Mm. But the safety that comes with this understanding, the lovingness that comes with it, has been extraordinary to me because I haven't done it. So there's nothing that I've done to make me feel safe. It's just beautifully and innately unfolded within me and being revealed as true within me. Mm. That's been mind blowing. It's like, do you mean I don't need to lift a little finger, but just kind of show up to, you know, the webinars to listen? That's all I need to do. Yes. And everything else happens. It's almost as if it's been designed specifically for me, for you, for everybody on this call. Again, it's individualized. So, so actually our experience is custom made. It's tailor-made for each one of, us, one of us, not only on this call, but on the planet, beyond all religion, beyond all color, creed, point of view, perspective. And that each individual is going to experience their thinking. And even more, there's a deeper order behind that guiding and nudging and 
until we become playful and lighthearted and we see life very differently. We see, we, we live in a different world. And it's a world of peace and grace. A friend of mine recently died last Tuesday. Mm-hmm. And she was my oldest friend um, living in Budley Salston. And she, she and her family had been very, very kind to me when I arrived in the UK, almost a refugee with three suitcases and found my way to Devon. They were very kind. So um, I was sort of kind of going in and out of uncomfortable feelings, worry for her, anxiety for her. She was in quite a lot of pain. Um, But even though she was a dear friend, she was never open to the principles. And seeing her suffer, I could have easily thought that the suffering that I was experiencing was hers. And I could have easily been emphasizing with that and innocently misunderstanding my experience. But underneath my experience, experience of my own thinking about her was the deepest compassion and love. And then they had to fit a, some of you would know about it a lot better than me, but they fit a a driver. Um, It's a morphine driver into the arm. And the day after that they had fitted that, I went to visit her. I could see she wasn't there. And you know, I was astonished at myself because I knew she was gone. She died on Tuesday morning and I have felt really quiet about it. So it's almost as if as I was seeing my thinking about her, or I wish she'd known the principles, you know, I was living in wishful thinking (laughs) for her. And in a, in a deep, innocent misunderstanding in that moment about how my mind worked. And it was almost as if when I saw that, the ideas that I'd had about death, dying, grieving, because, you know, I had, I'd worked with many clients who were grieving. And we've all got different ideas about it. You know, I worked with a lady once who'd been grieving for over 20 years because she felt that if she wasn't grieving, that meant that she wasn't remembering. Mm -hmm. So in a strange kind of way, I've worked with a lot of people with grieving, but this was the first time with this new understanding that I could see through my own thinking about her. And you know what? I feel totally at peace. It's, Beautifully weird (laughs) is how I would describe it and very unexpected and such a surprise. Now that might sound as if it would be partly heartless or not very kind thinking. But I think what was happening in the months leading up to during her illness, I probably was going through Um, thinking that it was all about her, but actually it was all about me. (laughs) And then when she actually passed, I could see the truth, you know, that we go back to wherever it was we came from, whatever that looks like for anybody is okay. Mm. And there's nothing more to think about that. And it's peaceful and graceful. And I couldn't understand how the carer could keep saying, oh, you know what, it's such a privilege to do this. That was a new thought for me. But I understand it now. I understand it more deeply because that's my experience. Thank you for sharing that with us. That was lovely. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think it's always... I think it's always nice to share our personal stories because it kind of it illustrates 
what we've seen in a beautiful way, really, doesn't it? How things have changed and how we can see things differently when we yeah. open ourselves up to seeing the true nature of thought, really, how that creates our experience in those moments. Yeah. And it's easy to forget. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah. You know, because when I first came into the principles, I thought, wow, Sydney Banks was enlightened. And I'd been searching for enlightenment for years mm -hmm. and gone down many red herring trails in my search for enlightenment. So I had some thinking and ideas and backstories about what enlightenment would look like from all the books that I'd read and people that I'd spoken to, people that I thought were very wise. And um, I must say, I'm seeing it very differently now. There's mm -hmm. that old saying about um, you go, you chop wood, you go to work, you get enlightened. <laughs> you chop wood, you go to work. And Sydney <laughs> Banks for me was a classic example of that. Because, you know, he used to get angry. He used to get disappointed. He used to, but, but, the more that we see that our experience only comes from our own thinking or our judgment of our own thinking, and we see how we give that meaning and then make up stories about it, the more we see that enlightenment is feeling bad and feeling good, hot and mm. cold, um, as experience as nothing more than experience. And the only reason that it makes my life good, bad, right, wrong, hot, cold, is the meaning that I give to my own thinking. Mm. So. So Andrea has um, said, that was a beautiful insight. Thank you, Anne. Do you have any more insights you can share with us? Yes, so in my search, what's coming to mind? In my search for, for God, really, <laughs> um, I didn't tell you in the beginning because I don't really share this with a lot of people, but it just seems appropriate. Um, when when I, I was really looking for God, right? And... Um, that little rhyme, you seek it here, you seek it there, you seek it everywhere. <laughs> and all my seekings were on the outside of me. Mm. So I gave up my job and I packed up everything that I owned into the boot of my little VW Polo, gave up my flat, and I went looking for God. And uh, if I turned left, I would have gone to Cornwall, and I knew what Cornwall was like, and I had a sense of going into the unknown. So I turned right and ended up in the Lake District with my little tent. I'd never tented in my life. <laughs> and the first night it rained, so I got rained on. And there were some young lads that passed my tent in the morning. And they said, do you know about guy ropes? And I thought they were talking a different language. <laughs> and they helped me with the guy ropes. And I stayed there a couple of nights. But I ended up camping all the way around Scotland looking for God. And I had some beautiful experiences, some wonderful, what I would have called spiritual experiences, camping at night under the stars in a little tent next to my car with the midges. Because <laughs> I didn't know about midges. But having these wonderful spiritual experiences, beautiful. And thinking that was it. And then after that, I went to Sri Lanka and back, back around Sri Lanka. And then people started asking me to do healing with them. I ended up living in a castle on the beach in South Africa, um, taking care of a castle. And then felt it was time to come home. And people were then inviting me to stay with them so, uh, and help them to develop their business. And that's how I became a coach. Mm. So really what I'm saying is when I came into the principles, my search for God was over. 
because I was looking everywhere but at the nose and the end of my face, at the within. And also in my search, I studied non-duality for about 10 years, tried to learn Sanskrit. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, couldn't do that but one of my most powerful insights was that non-duality never existed because the good, bad, the right, wrong I knew that there was something in the middle of there somewhere between right and wrong, good and bad hot and cold that was really powerful because I'd experienced it from time to time. You know how can we can just be sitting quietly and suddenly it appears as if the whole world stands still. Not even a bird chirps. It might be when the sun is setting. You know, the sky is beautiful, and blue and red, purple. Or it might be a, the smile on a child's face when it looks like the world is standing still. But of course, what I know now is that stillness happens deeply within us. And I realized that non-duality was something that was created in good faith, innocently, by really, really wise people thousands and thousands of years ago. That you had to study really hard mm. to get to. A particular point. So my insight was non-duality doesn't exist because there is no such thing as duality. So can you imagine how I felt, Andrea, when I'd been studying something really seriously you know, for 10 years only to discover that what I'd been studying never existed in the first place. That was very enlivening, I can tell you. <laughs> so a whole lot of thinking about that fell off my mind mm. and my search is over yeah i think that's the beauty of the principles isn't it we realize like life is so much simpler so much easier so much that we have been really really busy doing we kind of realize, oh yeah, I didn't really have to be doing that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And of course, insights can be, um, they don't have to be filled with thought. Because mm. I know that in, when I've looked back on my life in retrospect, I thought, oh, that's funny. I'm not reacting in that particular way anymore. Or, oh my goodness. Hmm. I'll tell you a classic example. I had a fallout with my eldest son uh, just before Christmas, and I won't go into the details of it because they would be boring for you. But I felt very hurt by something that he'd said. And so I hadn't really seen him over the Christmas period, but he and his fiance decided to visit. And so I had a lot of thinking of, about the the you know, welcome them, you know, with open arms, etc. But I had a lot of pre-thinking, so really setting myself up, you know, am I going to have a quiet talk to him? Do I want to thrash this out with him? You know, do I need to have that conversation with him? Is he <laughs> going to be open to it? And you know what? They knocked on the door. I opened the door and love opened the door. There was nothing else there nothing else there we had the most wonderful time together i've never had to talk to him about that thing and i can't remember having an insight so something happened in me and i don't know what it was but something happened in me that totally changed when I opened the door. Some things are occurring to me when you're talking like that, because I know a lot of the times 
One of the most difficult jobs I think we've got when we begin to share this is the fact that we can only use words to share it. And so we say things like insights and we say principles and mind, thought and consciousness and we say these things. And people have their own understanding of what that might mean and then they begin to look for an insight or try to understand these things. And you know, I'm, I'm the same. It's, it is extremely difficult to share this with words. And what's occurring to me when you're talking about that is I know we can get so hung up on our idea of what something should be like and then kind of run away with the idea that, oh, I've never had an insight or I don't understand this. And yet that's just thought too. And beneath that thinking, even without doing anything, even without ever having heard of anything about this we are kind of part of this system is we know this you know sharing this isn't <laughs> even adding anything there's nothing to add to anybody and every single human being is having insights all the time and is con connected is this understanding exactly mm. and i love what keith blevin says uh, no, sorry, it was key. It was Sydney Banks. He said, "When we have an insight, the ego, for the, the ego gets quiet." I beg your pardon. This is what he said: When we have an insight, the ego collapses its stories. Mm -hmm. And yes, you're quite right. We've been having them. It's just that they've been happening so fast yeah. that we haven't realized that we've been having them, which is hopeful and helpful. And the other thing to consider is that every single, I can't think of one, maybe somebody on this call can, but every single new innovation on the planet, like E equals MC squared, like... Um, all the, sci the scientific roadmaps that we've had have been through insight. Now, that's available to everybody, anytime, all the time. So it's nothing that we need to look for. It's something that's already there. That's the beauty of this. Simply through conversation, it can be uncovered or revealed. That's all that needs to happen. It doesn't have to be learned or earned. You don't have to be in a quiet mind to have an insight. You could have an insight in the middle of a trauma. It's that available. Yeah, and the other thing that I'm seeing, you know, it's like a, when we were at the retreat over the weekend, we were extremely blessed with beautiful weather and we were in a beautiful part of the countryside. But what I've kind of seen is that the beauty and love that we are is everywhere and anywhere. You know, it's not, it's not in beautiful, it is in beautiful places, but it's not only in beautiful places. It's literally, it's available to us no matter where we are and no matter what our circumstances. Yes, and sometimes the challenge is to see my own thinking mm. when it looks like something isn't beautiful to me. <laughs> yeah. And I'm up for that. <laughs> yeah. Because I know that that's where my learning curve is. Mm. That's where I'm going to learn the most. And, and we know that we're never going to know it all, ever. And I'm grateful for that. Really grateful. Yeah, it's nice to know no matter how, you know, no matter how long you've been looking in this direction, there's still more to see. The st and it almost kind of comes around the other way, doesn't it? We almost, the more I look in this direction, the more I realise I don't know anything at all. <laughs> and that, that, but that keeps me really humble, you know, Debbie. Mm. It really, it, it really does, it keeps me humble. 
when I know that I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere else for me to go with that, mm -hmm. but just to get quiet. Because the truth is, I don't know. And, and I'm really okay with not knowing. Because there was a time when I used to think I had to know, you know. Yeah. And if I didn't know there was something wrong, and that would make me feel, you know, I had to do research or make me feel quite anxious or quite fearful. I'm really comfortable with not knowing, which is such a beautiful experience of life. Mm. So I'm very conscious of the time. It has just clicked on till to eight o'clock. So Anna, are you all right for a minute or two if we ask if anyone has got a question at all before absolutely. we absolutely uh, yep, minute or two. So has anyone got anything that they would like to ask Anne or share? Anything you know you've heard tonight or anything would anyone like to share what's going on for them or? You can either unmute yourself or you can put your hand up if I can see your face. <laughs> Some of you are not on camera, so if you did that, I wouldn't know. <laughs> oh, Lucy, hang on. I will unmute you. Go, Lucy. Um, and I, it, it wasn't a question. It was just more just to, just to thank you so much for the way that you, you just you just have a way of speaking so beautifully and it just has had such a calming effect on, on my rather frazzled mind at the moment. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you so much for just how you've delivered everything that you've said. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. It was lovely to see you. Mm, you Hopefully too. we can catch up. Sometime. Yeah. I'd love that. It'll yeah. be really nice. Thank Great. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. So, would anyone else like to share anything? Add anything? Oh, Andrea says, thank you so much, Anne. I really enjoyed listening. Thank you. Thanks, mm. Andrea. It was really, really beautiful to listen to. It was really, as, you know, every like always it kind of blows my mind how all the webinars we do no two are the same at all and yet every one of them it's like oh my gosh you know I've, you just hear something different in different ways people speak so it's been an absolute mm. joy and a pleasure to have you here with us tonight so. thank you so much for having me oh um can you talk a little on what going inside means to you okay mm -hmm. would you like me to do that or yeah no no you go that's perfect okay mm. so going inside that's a beautiful question Gavin mm. um, actually I can't give you a prescription for that what I can do is give you my experience of what that looks like for me and it may look differently for you. But you know, when I talked earlier about when it looks like the world on the outside suddenly goes still, and then I just reflected that actually the truth of it is that that stillness is happening within me. And it feels to me as if there's some kind of alignment with my mind, heart and soul. And I would call it being in alignment with whatever you like, actually. But my experience of that is that deep stillness, that oneness with life. And seeing that life is not compartmentalized, that it only ever works one way. And that my experience of that stillness comes from within me and nowhere else. It's the territory for insight. It's very insightful. 
And I can tell you that when I've had problems with my boys or relationship problems, that stillness has been enormously helpful for me because it has enabled me to see my thinking in that partnership, in that relationship. And I tell you something, Gavin, it hasn't always been pretty. <laughs> you know, I used to think I was quite a nice person, but some of my thinking has been shocking to me. And it's made me feel uncomfortable and ashamed, guilty. Like, how could I think that? You know, how I'm supposed to be this nice person, but no. What it showed me even more deeply, that looking within, that responsible introspection, and the question that I might ask myself when I'm having some kind of upset with somebody else is, what's my part in this? Because I'm always ready to talk about what they said, what they did or didn't, you know, like my son. But if I have the presence of mind to ask myself, what's my part? And the gratitude of that stillness overwhelms me. And it looks like everything stops. I can hear coming from me, creating my own experience. What's creating my upset? So that looking within is the stillness that's available to all of us. And I imagine we're going to all experience it in a different way. I don't know, but I can only share with you what my experience is with that. And it's only a description. It's not a prescription of what to do or how to do looking within. Thank you. It's powerful, this stuff. <laughs> it's very, very powerful, isn't it's, it? <laughs> it's powerful. And when I meet myself in my looking within, forgiveness follows, compassion follows, and love for myself follows, which gives me the capacity to love more deeply, more profoundly. It's that neutrality. We come to that place of neutrality that Sydney Banks talked about, which is really unconditional love. I mean, humanity have been talking about unconditional love for thousands of years, but it's that neutrality that we experience that is the totality of love that we are and that everybody else on the planet is. So I hope that's helpful, Gavin. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> so has anyone else got anything else they would like to add before we let Anne go to, oh, hang on. Is this all right, Anne? Are you happy for a minute? Yeah, I'm good for this, yeah. Hello, Sharon. I think you are Hi. unmuted. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to say hello to you all. And um, I actually thought down here in the southwest, because I've come a roundabout way to finding you all, which means I'm just listening to this, how beautiful, and thinking to myself that, I didn't come to you in a roundabout way. This is all just <laughs> fallen into place because I actually found a Facebook, I found a Facebook post about anxiety because I was struggling with anxiety and it was Nicola Bird, A Little Peace of Mind, which I joined last May. I did a 12 week course with Nicola I went on to her advanced group for a little while and then she was sharing some podcasts with various people 
one of them was Amy Johnson and I had at that point um, at the end of the 12 week I kind of well the beginning of the 12 week I was just relieved just relieved to hand it all over to mind <laughs> and <laughs> I've been a control freak for so long I made myself a prisoner in my own home really I've been agoraphobic fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, absolutely miserable for the last 20 years and um, found Nicola. Then through Nicola, I joined the little school because I read Amy's book. So I've been with Amy now in little school, big change since November because I realized that all my thinking was habitual all my thinking about my pain levels, my fatigue, my eating habits, dieting, binging, all that sort of thing was all habitual. So I've been working with Amy and her lovely little school, but I really did want to find someone in the Southwest that I could connect to because I felt like Wow, I'm making these connections, but the other side of the <laughs> United States, for goodness sake, you know, I don't know anybody here. And um, I did a bit of a Google search. Um, Amy suggested I went on to the Three Beaches website and just saw where all the pr practitioners were. And I pulled up Liz Scott, uh, was one. And then through Liz's Thing, I found a retreat that you'd done I don't know how long ago but it was a picture of, it must have been maybe last year at Heartland I don't know but then I found you and this has only been my second week joining in with the lovely people and um, that, that and that was just beautiful absolutely beautiful and I do feel yes connected it's like this feeling that i a bit like coming home really isn't it you know it's a bit like yeah absolutely beautiful how what you've shared and i did i've never really studied anything i left school when i was 14 i um, married at 18 i've all i've had is like my children and it's a normal everyday job, I've not been to university or never studied anything. I've just just taken this this so easily though. I and I haven't questioned a lot of it. My intellect hasn't got in the way because I haven't got much. <laughs> and ego, well I didn't well, I suppose I had some ego left, obviously, because I was keeping all that control going. But um just the calmness, the peace, the peace I feel now. Um, there is this feeling, every, I mean, the little, little, you get the little voice, oh, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. You should be going out more, you know, and you should be. But for the moment, I'm just enjoying the peace. Mm. Just joining in the webinars and, and it's fatigue in a different way, really. It's, oh, that's beautiful. It's like a relaxed, you mm. know, I was fatigued before, but this is yeah. the thing, yeah. I know what you mean, Sharon. And, you know, a debt of gratitude to Deborah for getting this off the ground and, you know, um, having these webinars because I know it takes a huge commitment and, you know, bringing people into this kind of thing. It's a huge commitment. So, you know, I would really love to thank Deborah from the heart and soul for what she's doing. And, you know, the gratitude that you found her in that way. Of course, it was meant to be. But, but so beautiful that you connected with her. And that, that she's doing this work. It's beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, 
It's been a delight and a pleasure. I love what I do. I feel blessed and lucky to share in the way that I do. And I have an enormous amount of love and support around me, which hence is the lovely people webinars. I mean, look, we're surrounded by, look at all these lovely people. <laughs> Great idea. Great idea. So I think we will leave it there and let Anne have a, have a little bit of her evening. Sorry. No, it's absolutely fine. There's nothing oh, to sorry about things. I love listening to you. Mm, I did too. What mm. you said was so beautiful and simple and heartfelt. So no need for apology. Nothing to apologise for. It was no. lovely, lovely tear for you. Lovely. Hopefully, hopefully we will meet you in person one day at something. Exactly. So next week we have the lovely Jill Whalen as our guest. Um, and I am actually going to be on holiday with my family next week. So the lovely Lucy and Beck and Julie, I think, might be stepping into my shoes to, <laughs> to keep the lovely people webinar going while I am away. Um, so please still turn up. You know, we will still be doing this. Um, and if I can, I will tune in and watch. I don't know, um, you know exactly what's going to be going on. And it's about time that I spent some time with my family, I think. So... <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna love that so yeah so that's what so, we're doing next week sorry thank Anne. you so much for inviting me deborah and um, my love to you all Bless thank you thank you very very much Such for being joy. here and thank you yes yeah, like and shall i unmute everybody so i will uh, i think everybody is unmuted just to say goodbye um bye Anne. thank you very love much to you. Bye, love you. to you love to you thank you Thank you all very much and hopefully see some of you next week. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you.